Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 14097 in the name of Daniel Johnson on a report on autistic children's experiences of school. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Could I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Daniel Johnson to open the debate. Mr Johnson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I could begin this debate by reeling off percentages and numbers, but I won't. I want to start with a feeling. I think every member in the chamber will know that feeling of sitting in an over-hot car where there's practically anywhere you'd rather be, where even when you put the fan on, it just blasts hot air in your face. Now imagine what it would be like if you knew that there was a wasp in the car beside you. I think most of us would flinch. We might flail a little bit. If we realized the doors were locked and we couldn't wind down the windows, we might start banging on the windows. Some of you might be shouting. And if there was someone sitting next to you who didn't help you and just told you off, and in fact told you that you couldn't use the car, because of your reaction, I think you'd find that very unfair. Now, the reason for that analogy was because that wasp in the car was the way that somebody expressed what it feels like to have a meltdown if you're a person with autism. And what we're doing in terms of our, the education system is all too often we are telling those people off when they're having those situations and excluding them from the car. So, that's what this debate is about, is about building that understanding. And yes, there are important details in this report, but first and foremost, if there is one thing that we can do in this debate, it is a building that understanding of autism and what it feels like, because that would be the start that I think so many people in Scotland, so many people with autism need. I'd like to thank the National Autistic Society of Scotland, Scottish Autism and Children First for the brilliant report that they compile because I think it does that very important work of shining the light of that experience of how it feels for autistic children in, in our school system. But above all else, I'd like to thank the parents and the young people who participated in that survey because without that, that wouldn't be possible. And I'm also very pleased that so many fellow MSPs who are at the launch of that report are in the chamber here this evening because I know that they will share my feelings from that event of shock and of anger, hearing of parents having to lawyer up to fight for the legal rights of their children to be educated. Families forced to homeschool, not because it was their choice, but because there was no other option for them to have their children educated. And children not just told off, but seven-year-olds, barely able to write their own name, asked to sign pledges to modify their behavior at school. And most shockingly for me, hearing of the experience of some young people who are forcibly taken from their classroom and put into 12 foot by 12 foot windowless soft rooms because of their behavior. That's what's happening to some children today in Scotland, in our schools. And I think we need to make this the first step towards ending those experiences. So the report is important. I think it shines a very real and an important spotlight on the experiences of many children in our education system. And I think the most uh, distressing findings is the, the level of exclusions in our schools, both formal and informal. 13% of parents said that their children had been formally excluded. Three quarters of those excluded on more than one occasion. But on top of the informal exclusions, the, the, I think the truly worrying uh, picture is the, the degree to which unlawful informal exclusions are being used. 37% of children, a third of, over a third of parents reported their child had been excluded informally. A quarter of those that that was happening more than once a week. And those informal exclusions are described as cooling off periods, timeouts. But these are children being excluded without record, without notification. And let us be very clear here this evening, that is against the law and should not be happening. But on top of this also is the use of part-time timetabling. Now indeed, part-time timetabling can be part of the educational solution for children with autism. But unfortunately, the majority of situations this is being instigated by schools, not by parents. And for some children, that part-time timetable means as little as an hour of education a day. And we do have to be careful with these numbers. This is a survey. It is informal. They, they're not necessarily representative. 
But if you look at the total number of respondents, it represents 10% of the autistic pupil population. So I think we have to take them seriously. Now, beyond these findings on exclusion, there was also the findings around the impact on children, children whose educational progression has been diminished, children a number of years behind where they should be in comparison to peers, but, but more importantly, the isolation that many of them feel and their overall well-being and mental health impacted by their experiences at schools. Beyond that, the impacts of the family were also reported, where parents have to choose between their work and their child receiving education, and the impact it has on their uh, mental health being and their relationships. But perhaps I think, the, in some ways, the most troubling were the views on what would make a difference. And these were simple things, improved understanding on behalf of the teachers entrusted to deliver the education, improved support, improved communication. This is not complicated things, this is basic, and we must make sure that they happen. Now, there are a number of calls to action in the report, dealing with the exclusions, improving the level of specialist teachers in schools within, uh, 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 skills within schools and the wider school community. The need to have uh, the, the, the neurodevelopmental disorders and autism particularly uh, included within initial teacher education. We need minimum standards on hours uh, of education. I think these should be adopted in full, and I think I'd like, and I'd like to hear what the minister has to say. But I think these calls do not go far enough. We must invest in teachers and their capacity to deal with additional support needs. They do an amazing job. And no word of my speech here this evening or the report is a criticism of the fantastic job that teachers do. But they are not getting the support they deserve. Specialist teacher numbers have been cut by 20% since 2010. We know that educational psychologists, and while there's been recent funding announcements, they have declined in a, over a similar period. We know that the, there is a lack of provision for ongoing training and development. That was the findings of the Education Committee just recently. We must ensure that there are availability of appropriate placements for autistic children, because while mainstreaming should be what we aim to, for some children, they do need specialist education. But those specialist places are rarer and rarer for those that need them. But above all, I'd like to call, look at Call 9 because it asks for people to be made more aware of their rights to education. And I don't know if that calls right. I don't think people should have to know of their rights to education, their child's rights to education. I think they should expect it. And this is where the government must step in, because there is a legal duty of local authorities to provide education. And there is a duty uh, uh, from the 2004 Act for additional support for learning, support for whatever reason and that is regardless of formal diagnosis or assessment. That law must be enforced. People deserve their legal rights, and the government must ensure that local authorities extend it to them. But above all else, we have, I think, a, a very honourable commitment to mainstream schooling, because in the end of the day, we live in a mainstream world, and if we do not prepare our young people to live in it, we are going to fail them. But equally, that commitment to mainstreaming is for nothing if in reality what mainstreaming means is exclusion from school and a very limited timetable. And at that point, point I would, I'll close. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. <laughs> I can I remind uh, members in the public area, we do not permit applause in the public gallery. I understand why it's done, but it's not permitted. Uh, open debate, Richard Lyle, followed by Annie Wells. Mr Lyle, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I thank Daniel Johnson for securing this member's debate on such an important issue. Tonight, I want to tell a story, my constituents, uh, Kieran's personal story, and I only have four minutes to tell it in. Kieran attended mainstream primary in North Lancashire from P13. It was evident even at this time Kieran had social and uh, emotional difficulties and struggled with slight challenging behaviour at times around school, nothing noteworthy or enough to promote real investigation. His parents thought if there were investigations required, teachers would highlight this to them as they were the professionals. In primary three, Kieran's mother made the decision to move him to a smaller primary school, which she had researched and found to have a supportive ethos. The family moved only a couple of miles, but this put them into South Lancashire. My constituency is made up of areas from North Lancashire and South Lancashire. His parents were very unhappy that Kieran's behaviour was put down to 
troublemaking, bad temper when he's actually struggling to cope with sensory, social and emotional issues. He was generally a kind and sensitive boy. On moving schools, they were linked in with educational psychology in South Lancashire. From there, many agencies within NHS to pursue a, a diagnosis of autism. Kieran did not have formal support in school at the time, however, due to the skills and experience of the individual teachers and a lot of luck, he was fairly settled until primary six. Kieran at this time had been brought through the assessment process for autism. It was felt it didn't meet all the criteria, which is another failing. However, Kieran is just one of those cases. As they moved to further independence and in education, advanced peer issues and a change of teacher in P7, Kieran began to really struggle. He had many absences, his mental health became very poor, anxiety about school becoming a daily struggle. This resulted in Kieran becoming suicidal and a referral to CAMS was made. The family worked with CAMS, we felt Kieran did make the criteria for autism diagnosis and Kieran eventually was diagnosed in December 2017. The family moved back to North Lancashire and Kieran was enrolled to start in his local secondary school. Parents had reservations about Kieran's ability to cope in Main Street High School, given the impact his last year of primary had on him. However, no alternatives were offered. It became quite apparent that Kieran was not coping with high school, alongside his autism, diagnosis and hypermobility, which restricted his mobility and caused pain and fatigue. His parents approached the school, highlighted their concerns. Guiding teachers observed how Kieran was upset and his parents were assured action would be taken. By October, Kieran was so impacted by his daily adverse, adverse experience at school, he again became mentally unwell. His mother had to take him to see their GP. Kieran attended sporadically until January when the decision was made by school and staff from North Lancashire to put in place a part-time timetable. However, a lack of support for Kieran meant he only got nine sessions before, before he became so unwell that he completely refused to attend. Kieran is still out of school. Mentally, he's mentally recovered, keen to be educated. His mother has researched, contacted, visited many independent schools. They actually were offered a place in an independent school, specialising with boys with ASD. His mother applied for a placing request with North Lancashire Council. They refused it. His mother has now contacted, as has already been said, Govan Law Centre. Quite honestly, local councils are failing Kieran and others like him. Having previously been a councillor, I know that a council could serve, serve these people better and I would be pressing them to do so. And, and the reports that, that uh, Daniel Johnson went over, I could read them out also, but I'm running out of time. We're all parents, we're all grandparents, uncles, aunts. Therefore, we as politicians must look into this subject and aid councils to do better. We can't fail Kieran. And we can't feel people like them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Annie Wells to be followed by Ian Gray. Ms. Wells, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> and I'd too like to thank Daniel Johnson for bringing this very important debate to the Chamber today. As a convener of the Cross Party Group in Autism, I am really pleased to see autism getting the attention it deserves. When I set up the CPG a year ago, I never anticipated the level of interest it's received. Meeting to meeting, we've seen more and more people attend, evidence of just how strongly people feel about the need for change. At our last meeting in October, we focused solely on education, and I am grateful to the Deputy First Minister for joining us at that meeting. We, we used the joint report by the National Autistic Society of Scotland, Scottish Autism and Children in Scotland as our point of reference. These experiences will, not, will of course not be representative of everyone, there will be examples of great practice across Scotland, but what is clear from the, from the key findings of not included, not engaged, not involved, is that there is a systematic problem. 34% of parents and carers said their child had been unlawfully excluded from school in the previous two years. 28% said their child had been placed on a part-time table and in, in the last two years. And 85% said they did not receive the support to catch up on work they had missed. As a result, many children with autism are regularly missing school due to stress and anxiety, and as a result, suffer from low self-esteem. At the meeting, we heard from two young, two young people, Rachel Birch and Jasmine Gilby, representatives of the Scottish Women's Autism Network, 
and I thank them both for allowing me to share the following with you. As someone that was only diagnosed with autism at the age of 14, Rachel had no transitional support when starting secondary school. And by her third year, her anxiety was so bad that she began to refuse to go to school and experience panic attacks. Upon her diagnosis, the school was unsure of how to support her and the support she did receive, she believed to be in line with punishment for non-autistic individuals. Ultimately, feeling suicidal, Rachel now feels strongly that teachers receive better training for, um, and more positive narrative is built around autism. Jasmine, who was diagnosed with autism at four, spoke of how she felt ostracized at school due to a lack of understanding around the condition. As a victim of bullying, she felt like things were made worse by being put in separate classes with children with additional support needs, eventually leading her to attempt to take her own life. Although Jasmine's situation is now improving upon leaving school and receiving CBT, this is evidence of how the system can fail to support those youngsters who need it more and the potentially drastic consequences it can result in. Thankfully, there are ways in which the situation can be improved. The report outlines nine calls to action, as we've heard from, from Daniel Johnson. These focus on improving understanding of autism within schools, with a call to increase the numbers of specialist teachers and enhance programmes in initial teacher training and continual professional development. They also focus on monitoring the use of part-time timetables and reducing the number of exclusions, both formal and informal, as well as making sure children are aware of their rights to additional support for learning, that, that should they need this, the resource is there. The Scottish Conservatives have supported these proposals with the belief that it's imperative child and young people with autism are given the best start in life. This is a systematic issue in Scottish schools and one that affects not just those with autism. The number of specialists additional support needs teachers has declined by 16% over the past five years, with the number of pupils identified with ASN increasing by 55% over the same period. What's clear is that the pressure on teachers are huge, and if we are to give those with autism the best start in life, then the Scottish Government needs to take action to support pupils and schools. The CPG will continue to play an active role in monitoring if those actions are being delivered on. To finish today, Deputy President Officer, I'd like again to thank Daniel Johnson for bringing this important topic to the Chamber. <coughs> the years you spend progressing through school play such a huge role in shaping you and your values for making your way in the world. It helps create the opportunities and confidence to take on the career you wish to. But for those faced with autism, those years can be even more make or break. That is something we should all strive to change, and I remain fully committed to doing so. Thank you very much. I call Ian Gray to be followed by Ross Greer, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I want to start uh, by saying well done to Daniel Johnson for bringing this debate forward. But more to the point, I want to say uh, well done to the three organisations involved in producing and publishing this report. Uh, this is uh, one of those issues, I think, which we all suspected was happening, uh, but it was almost impossible to prove. I suspect most of us have had constituents, parents of autistic children, who have come to us about a failure to provide their child with the education to which they are entitled. But the fact that the currencies are hidden amongst 32 local authorities and amongst thousands of schools makes the scale of the problem difficult to see. Moreover, as it turns out, the most egregious failure, the use of unlawful exclusions, is even more hidden as it remains unrecorded. So we really should acknowledge the effort in establishing the evidence in this report and what shocking evidence it is. One quarter of parents had seen their child formally excluded in the last two years, but a third, more than a third, had suffered informal, i.e. unlawful, exclusion. Look, we all know what the issue is here. Mainstreaming of children with additional support needs is absolutely the right principle. But the right principle is worthless without the right practice. And that manifestly means enough support staff and enough resources to make mainstreaming work for all concerned, but above all for the children 
themselves. Otherwise, we are simply mainstreaming failure, frustration, and frankly, hypocrisy on our part when we pretend to be all about fairness. Of course, these issues do not apply only to children with a diagnosis of autism. After all, they only account for some 8% of children with additional needs. But the fact that the Enquirer Special Needs Helpline sees 46% of calls coming from parents of autistic children tells us that they are being particularly ill-served and are, so to speak, the canaries in the coal mine, alerting us to a wider problem to which we must respond. So now that we have the evidence, the onus uh, is on the Cabinet Secretary to tell us what he's going to do. Warm words are not going to be enough to solve this problem, only more support. And that does mean more additional needs teachers and additional support workers is going to do that. Yet at Education Committee last week, the government's head of support in the Learning Directorate admitted to us that she has no idea how many additional needs support workers we have in our schools, never mind how many we need. She suggested that because this was all up to councils uh, and because they call these jobs different things, it's all too difficult to find out how many there are, or I suppose whether there are any at all. Anyway, she told committee members, additional support isn't just provided through additional needs teachers or support workers. And of course that's true, as we can see from eight of the nine recommendations in this report. But I have to say, she rather gave the impression that it was a bit quaint of us to think that such a thing as specialist staff mattered much at all. This report tells us that autistic children are being routinely, illegally denied their place at school. More specialist staff to support them might not be everything that they need, but my goodness, it would be a start to turning this around. And I hope the Cabinet Secretary will tell us how and when that's going to happen. Thank you. I call Ross Greer to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Mr Greer, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And like colleagues, I'd like to thank Daniel Johnson for the opportunity to discuss this issue in the Chamber today. Not Included, Not Engaged, Not Involved is a report title which shouldn't really surprise anyone in Parliament. As Ian Gray said, many of us will be used to receiving casework like uh, this on a regular basis. It certainly doesn't surprise young people with autism, their parents, their carers, teachers or support staff. This was really valuable work done by children in Scotland, Scottish Autism and the National Autistic Society and we should be grateful for it. It's a really invaluable insight into the lives of young people with autism in Scotland today. It sets out how our education system is failing far too many young people. Over a third of parents and guardians uh, who responded reported that their child had been unlawfully excluded from school in the last two years, most of them on multiple occasions. Just under 30% said that their child had been put on a part-time timetable. 85% said they didn't receive support to catch up on the work that they had missed while they had been excluded. And this report only adds to the substantial body of evidence that's building on the failure in Scotland to properly support children and young people with additional needs. The number of specialist additional needs teachers has dropped by over 400 in eight years. That loss of expertise means classroom teachers are left without the additional support and without the specialist knowledge needed to support every pupil. Those classroom teachers themselves are struggling uh, to support every young person in their class. They're doing so with increased workloads, with 3,500 of their own colleagues lost over the last decade. This is fewer people with fewer expertise expected to do more with less, and it isn't working. Support staff who used to assist pupils with additional needs directly are now being stretched to support the whole class instead. Often the staff with specialist skills and training have simply been cut completely with the general classroom assistant staffing expected to take on the role of supporting young people uh, with needs such as autism which they simply don't know enough about. The Scottish Government, as Ian Gray mentioned, has even redefined the information published on specialist support assistance, grouping them now into a more general, to the point of almost meaningless category of pupil support assistant. 
Instead of asking why these specialist assistants are no longer doing that job, it feels like the government have given up and accepted the loss of that defined and important role. Not included, not engaged, not involved is far from the only evidence that we have. Last year, the Education Committee undertook an inquiry into additional support needs in Scottish schools. We got hundreds of submissions, particularly from teachers and from parents of pupils with additional needs. I think the Chamber will recall some of that evidence. The staff member who was told to watch the Big Bang Theory to learn more about how they could support a young person with Asperger's. We were told how patchy training on additional needs is for teachers in Scotland, that so much training depends on a cascade model where one teacher actually gets the training, then passes on what they know to others. That's why specialist additional needs teachers are so important, but with the loss of so many of them, passing on that knowledge is often not possible. The range of recognised additional needs is vast. The range of potential, uh, potential forms of support that young people with autism need is vast. Every young person is unique. Their needs are unique as well. Many teachers and parents also highlighted the importance of identification of additional needs in the first place. Again, this is an area where specialist teachers and support staff are able to identify additional needs are key, but one where there's a colossal inconsistency across the country. Educational psychologists play a vital role here as well, but the number of educational psychologists in our schools has really dwindled, particularly after the government cut the bursary for that qualification in 2012. Now, the Greens were critical of the loss of that bursary, and we welcome its reintroduction announced earlier this year. That was absolutely the right move for the government to make, and we'll wait with interest to see if it helps to recover the number of people going into those courses and then into those roles. Accessing the support that they're entitled to is clearly an issue for young people with autism and for their families. There's been a drop of one third since 2010 in the number of pupils with coordinated support plans. That's the only statutory support plan. CSPs allow parents and young people a right of appeal if their needs are not being met. So their decline is deeply alarming. We have a principle of mainstreaming in our schools, but mainstreaming without adequate support is not inclusion, it's exclusion. And it's all entirely avoidable. Our young people deserve the government taking action based on the suggestions in this report. They deserve the government to genuinely get it right for every child. Thank you. Before I call Mark Macdonald, can I say due to the number of members still wishing to speak in the debate, I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. So can I invite uh, Daniel Johnson to move a motion without notice? Moved. The question is the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. So I now call Mark Macdonald to be followed by Angela Constance. Mr Macdonald, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by thanking Daniel Johnson for securing this important debate? And as he did, I commend the work of National Autistic Society Scotland, Scottish Autism and Children in Scotland for pulling together this report uh, and the parents and young people who contributed their experiences to this report uh, in order that we might better understand what is uh, or is not happening in our education system. It is that in mind that I want to focus the majority of my speech on the experience of one of my constituents. She has requested I anonymise her and her children, and so I will refer to her as C, and her experience centres around her children A and M. Much of what she sent me has had to be abridged, but I will write to the Cabinet Secretary with the full details after the debate if he would find that helpful. C discussed various concerns she had in relation to A with his health visitor and with nursery staff. These were dismissed as typical boy behaviour or something he will grow out of. By the time he was at primary, concerns were again raised but were dismissed on similar grounds. By P2, he was really struggling and displaying challenging behaviour at home prior to and after school and began refusing to attend school. Finally, following a meeting with the head teacher, a referral to CAMS occurred and a diagnosis of autistic spectrum disorder and comorbid ADHD was received. In primary three, despite various measures being put in place, A was being taught one-to-one -one in either the corridor or the head teacher's office if a PSA was unavailable. The family made repeated requests for alternative provision to be considered, such as Camp Hill or Mile End, but were advised that A was too able academically and the school were meeting his needs. Eventually, A was removed from school by his family due to a deterioration in his physical and emotional health. This was in primary three. Following an emergency GERFEC meeting, it was finally agreed that Aberdeen City Council would consider an alternative placement, and he was eventually granted a full-time place at Camp Hill. He now thrives in the environment which Camp Hill provides, as opposed to mainstream education. C advises me that with her son M, she had to relive the entire experience again. 
Despite him already being under assessment for ASD, the nursery system did not adapt to or support his needs. Multiple measures were put in place at school, as they had been with A, but they were always reduced or removed when M showed any sign of coping, thus escalating matters and forcing the cycle to repeat. Both A and M experienced illegal exclusions and being placed on part-time timetables, before C eventually took the decision to remove M from education and to homeschool instead. After a year of home education, C looked into returning M to mainstream education, but his catchment school refused to provide one-to-one -one support, which had been in place prior to homeschooling, and also insisted on replacing his current reading method, which had proven successful, with phonics, which had been unsuccessful for three years at primary. C feels she has been completely failed by the education system, and as a result of the traumatic experience of A and M, her third son has refused school and is also being home educated. C advises me that while home education is working and her sons are thriving, it is not the choice she wanted to make. It has led to the household being dependent on a single income, and that means the family struggle financially as a consequence. This in turn places a great deal of worry and stress on the family unit. C is not the only constituent in these circumstances. I have seen many examples of part-time timetabling where parents are forced into a situation of either sourcing childcare or reducing or quitting their employment. At the same time, I have spoken to parents who have found mainstream can work for their children, but in many of those cases it has been through the work of a specific school or a specific teacher rather than a wider ethos. One parent told me her son now does well at his current school, but at his former school, she was advised that his behaviours were probably a consequence of how she parented him. Now, I have spoken in this chamber on many occasions regarding autism, often viewed through the experience of my son. I am fortunate that he has been placed appropriately in education, but that doesn't matter to the people who responded to this survey. Parents don't want a system that works for other people's children. They want a system that works for their children too. The review of mainstream presumption was instigated as a consequence of a question I asked in the last session of Parliament, and I hope that we might see some progress around this issue. I have devoted a great deal of my time in this Parliament, and will use whatever remains of it, to ensure that we live up to the principles we have collectively signed up to in relation to GERFEC, getting it right for every child. Not getting it right for most children, not getting it right for the majority of children, but getting it right for every child. This survey shows that we still have a journey to travel to achieve that ideal, and that must give us pause for thought and resolve to do better. Thank you. I now call Angela Constance to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Mr Burnett is the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Constance, please. President Officer, uh, like Daniel Johnston, I'll start uh, with a feeling. Uh, I felt compelled to add my name in support uh, of the motion before us tonight. Uh, and I did so after reading the report, not included, uh, not engaged and not involved. Uh, like others, I want to commend the authors of that report, Children in Scotland, the National Autistic Society and Scottish Autism. Because it's quite simply uh, not right on any level for any child not to receive their educational entitlements, as highlighted by the survey uh, of nearly 15 100 parents and I know that that will be shared by MSPs and all ministers too and I don't say this lightly but the level of exclusions unlawful exclusions part-time timetables and missed schooling uh, shown in this particular survey is utterly unacceptable uh, and indeed shocking and if this wasn't bad enough 85 percent of children in the scope of the survey didn't receive any support to catch up on the work that they'd missed. And like others, my main motivation for speaking in this debate tonight is to speak up for the, the countless uh, parents that I've had the privilege of representing uh, over many years. Because being a parent is the most important job you'll ever have. It's actually the hardest job you'll ever have. And it's harder still if you're the parent of a child with additional support need, such as autism. And parents of children with additional needs are always having to tenaciously fight and battle for what should be their children's right, what should be the norm. It must be utterly, utterly exhausting to have to constantly do battle with services, whether it's the DWP, education, health or social work, only often to be labelled as difficult or controlling or overprotective. So services and politicians uh, need to work harder at really listening to 
and responding to what parents are telling us about their children. And I hosted a reception in Parliament a few weeks ago to uh, showcase the work of the multicultural family base who support children and families uh, from a refugee or migrant background uh, with those uh, crucial early years transitions. They're a voluntary organisation who support the whole family on a wide range of issues and a flexible way that works. And we need to be tapping into the talents of the third sector in addition to statutory services, particularly when it comes to developing uh, that whole school approach uh, as recommended in the report. And there is also a need to get better at providing the right support at the right time and to get it right for every child the first time because the impact of failed educational placements is hugely disruptive and damaging to our children's well-being and only adds to that sense of rejection and exclusion. And the testimony of the parent in the report who said, I had to pick him up every day at 12 and it was like that for seven years, absolutely screamed to me. It screamed to me either no package of support eh, or the wrong level of support or indeed the wrong school. And unlike cases that I was involved in, say, a decade ago, the issues don't appear to be with diagnosis or unidentified needs. In fact, it's actually about uh, not responding to known needs. Uh, and this, uh, in my view, is uh, potentially negligent uh, and, as Daniel Johnson says, in the breach of the law of this land and indeed raises important questions for us all. A constituent uh, showed me the statutory plan that was devised for her wee boy last year when he was in primary one. Nothing happened and he's now in primary two. And it's now Groundhog Day chasing up reviews and planning meetings. And of course, you're only five once in your life. So where was the support and early intervention for that wee boy? And there is clearly a need for that fuller spectrum of services, whether mainstream or specialist, so that plans are acted upon, so that words are put into action. And I don't demur from the importance of resources, as they are indeed central. And there are, of course, questions for local and national government and some quite tough questions. But there is also something about culture, about attitudes, about how services are delivered and by whom, and crucially, there is something about putting our laws into practice where it matters the most, on the front line and in our classrooms. And I therefore support the recommendations in this report. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Alexander Burnett. Mr Burnett, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also thank Daniel Johnson for bringing this important topic to the Chamber and thank members across the Chamber for supporting this issue. Now, when I was first elected as an MSP in 2016, I knew that casework would be a priority, and the topic of autism and Asperger's has quickly become a growing concern. At first, it was just a few cases of families reaching out for help with their children diagnosed with autism. But then the scale of the issue became more apparent, with adults, teachers, social services, the council, and more, bringing forward how lacking the support for those with autism and Asperger's was. I met with the CEO of Aberdeenshire Council yesterday, and a meeting with NHS Grampian officials next week to discuss progress on this subject. I'm grateful for their attention now. Now, after speaking with those who work with the autism community, it is important to note that the report, not included, not engaged, not involved, applies as much to Aberdeenshire as anywhere else in Scotland. Because for all the good intentions of Scottish Government ministers wishing strategies, if those required to create and deliver them are not supported, then the result, as we see, is failure. And this not only applies to education, but employment, housing, and mental health services too. Because many families face great difficulty in finding a pathway for autism diagnosis. However, even with a diagnosis, the support is often lacking. And whilst I commend our teachers, unfortunately, there are not enough with autism qualifications. And this ultimately results in a failure to implement the correct support, meaning children and families fall through the net. And I met someone just last week whose story echoes the issues that this motion brings to the debate today. Now, I also don't have time to tell the full story of what this family has gone through, but even this abbreviated account shows how badly this family has been let down. Firstly, the primary school refused to submit the child for diagnosis for dyslexia. 
and after privately paying for it, a diagnosis was given. The same then happened at secondary school, where the parents had to pay privately for a diagnosis of Asperger's. And the organization they were put to, following a GP referral, then blamed the parents for the child's behavior and only accepted that the child had Asperger's after the privately paid for diagnosis was passed on. The school's guidance then referred the family to social work as a family in crisis, putting even more stress on the family. The organization forced the child to appointments which was a struggle because the child had to be escorted to school due to their Asperger's. And at one of these appointments, the child was told that it was good they had not mentioned suicide, much to the parents' horror that this idea could be put in their child's head. Now, the school has done their best to provide what support they can, but with a lack of access to practical support and help from resource centers, the family are unsure about the future for their child. Mental health is a topic that has come to the forefront of national conversation in recent years, which I am grateful to see. And after working with families and organizations in the autism community for over two years now, I'm keen to see that our education system takes the lead on treating those with mental health conditions with the correct support. So I call on the Scottish Government to ensure that all children are provided with the correct support so that they can all reach their full potential in life. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Burnett. I call on John Swinney to close the Government Cabinet Secretary, please. Uh, President Officer, let me begin by um, congratulating uh, Daniel Johnston on bringing this debate to Parliament and thanking him for raising uh, a very important topic um, with which I have enormous sympathy in the issues that he has raised today. Uh, can I also express my thanks to Children in Scotland, the National Autistic Society and Scottish Autism for the production of the report not included not engage and not involved. Um, I gave Parliament a commitment that I would engage with the organisations to consider the findings of this report and uh, I have met with all three organisations and I'm looking actively at the issues that are raised uh, by the report. Uh, and I also um, should put on the record that as a number of colleagues have done in the course of this debate today that in my 21 year service as a member of parliament, um, I have met uh, many constituents who have wrestled with these challenges. Uh, these uh, are very difficult situations that parents find themselves in. Um, they want to make sure that their young people are given every opportunity um, to prosper, to thrive in the way that Mr Burnett has just talked about. And they want to ensure that services are available to support uh, their children to achieve their potential. And that is a, a completely and utterly natural aspiration for any parent to, to wish uh, to ensure is the case. Um, and as I have wrestled with some of these cases over time, um, I have wrestled with uh, some challenges, which I'll talk about in the course of the addressing the issues that members of parliament have raised today, which are yes, about resources, but they are also about attitudes and about ethos. And I think we kid ourselves if we think all of this is simply about resources. It's a significant issue, but there are significant issues about attitudes and ethos that are relevant in the consideration of these questions. And attitudes and ethos have underpinned the policy thinking that has gone into the approach which uh, was taken forward by the Standards in Scotland Schools Act 2000, which was supported extensively within this parliament and which brought in the presumption of mainstreaming for the education of young people within Scotland. And what has flowed from that has been a set of policy interventions which have been designed to give guidance to our education system about how the policy, the principle of mainstreaming in education should be deployed. So when I read in the not included, not engaged and not involved report, about the experience of individual families, about exclusions from, uh, from school education. Uh, much of that practice, as I confirmed to Mr. Mandel in a question that he asked me a few weeks ago in Parliament, is completely at odds with the guidance that is in place. Completely at odds with it. So there is a question that we have to address, and it's, a, a, it's an important question about the degree to which our policy framework as it currently stands provides sufficient um, guidance and sufficient rigour 
uh, to ensure that what we aspire for in this Parliament, which is, I recognise is broadly shared across the political spectrum, is actually delivered on the ground uh, by individual authorities. And that brings me on to one of the, the points that Daniel Johnson raised about uh, the government, uh, uh, Mr Johnson's call for the government to step in to enforce the law with local authorities on the right to education. And I agree entirely with the sentiments about the right to education of every young people. I'm, I stand here as a very firm advocate of the principle of our obligation throughout the system in every respect to get it right for every child. But the question of the government stepping in to instruct or require uh, or oblige local authorities to take certain courses of action um, is, a is a step for which, frankly, I think Parliament would have to consider whether it wishes to empower the government to do exactly that, because the, government, because the Parliament at the present moment seems, in my view, reluctant to empower the government to require and oblige local authorities to do certain things. And many of these decisions are taken operationally by local authorities. Of course I'll Daniel you. Jones. I, mean, I accept that point, and I'm, I'm thankful for, for the, the Cabinet Secretary for giving way, in general points of policy. But if things are set out in law, if there are legal obligations, what is the point of the law if it's not enforced and if it's not honoured? I'm, 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 I'm not disputing that point at all. What I'm making the point to Mr Johnson and to Parliament is that if Parliament wishes the government to intervene in local authority practice to the extent that Mr Johnson suggested in his opening remark, then uh, Parliament needs to consider very actively the support it gives to the government to intervene in local authorities where that should be required to be the case. If Mr Mundell will forgive me, I don't have a lot of time and I need to come on to another substantive issue that uh, I'll, I'll, I'm in the presence of. I'm happy to give you the time, oh, Cabinet well, Secretary. Of course, of course. Oliver Mundell. Thank you uh, very much, Deputy President Officer Cab and Cabinet Secretary, for giving way. I wonder if the government is not able to intervene whether the Cabinet Secretary would support calls uh, I've made previously for the Children's Commissioner to step in and look at some of uh, these breaches. Uh, of children's rights to education and whether he thinks that's a potential avenue to tackle some of the bad practice uh, that we're Cabinet seeing. Cabinet Secretary. But I, don't, I, I don't think there's anything that would stop the Children's Commissioner deciding to inquire about anything. That's, the Children's Commissioner is a, a parliamentary appointee who's free to inquire about any topic uh, he chooses to inquire about. That wasn't the point I was making to Mr Johnson. The point I was making to Mr Johnson was about the relationship between government and local authorities where uh, I think uh, Mr Johnson raises some very significant issues about uh, what practice should be taken forward. The other uh, Yes? Joanne Lamont. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would agree with me that I'm about the concern and perhaps suggesting that it's only about resources or it's only about attitude and ethos. Attitude and ethos is really important. Government has a very powerful tool by willing the means to deliver on the policy commitment we've all got to inclusive education. And that is what local authorities and teachers and support people and, and families are saying. There's simply not the resource there to support their young people. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, that, that brings me on to the point that I was just about to make, which is about resources. And what we see in uh, the most recent data that's available to us is that in 2016-17, local authorities um, deli delivered a real terms increase in expenditure on education services. And within that, there was a 2.3% increase in real terms, 4.5% increase in cash terms in the funding that was made available to additional support for learning within the education system. Now, these are the local government statistics that I'm quoting to Joanne Lamont. Which brings me on to the, 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 the other substantive point that I wanted to make to the Conservatives. Now, I listen with care to the, the, the words that uh, Annie Wells and Alexander Burnett have put forward to Parliament, uh, as I listen carefully to the points that all members of Parliament make. But when it comes to, and this is where Joanne Lamont has a fair point about willing the means, when it comes to budget decisions, the Conservatives don't generally argue for more public spending when it comes to the day that it matters on, which is budget day. And on budget day, we have to make our hard choices about what money is available. And we took decisions as a government last year for which the Conservatives roundly criticised us 
which involved increasing the public expenditure that was available. And yet the Conservatives come here for quite understandable reasons and make a plea for more resources. And I simply say, in the space of this member's debate, to encourage the Conservatives to reflect on some of the real choices uh, that face us in relation to public expenditure. Of course, I'll give one. Annie Wills. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister, and thank you, um, Cabinet Secretary. Can the Cabinet Secretary also agree with the Scottish Conservatives that this is already in legislation that people should, that children should have the right to a proper education, and the, the cuts that have been made so far are 16%, but we've seen those diagnosed with autism increase by 55%. Well, I, I Mr. Mr. Lyle, please. Cabinet Secretary. I think Annie, Annie Wells essentially makes my point for me that um, we are dealing with um, a set of financial circumstances and have been dealing with a set of financial circumstances since 2010, which have been acutely challenging because of the financial approach taken by the Conservative government in London. And we've taken some decisions to try to counter that, for which the Conservatives in Scotland have criticised us, and yet the Conservatives come here asking us to spend more resources on additional support for learning, for which, in my view, there is an absolutely justifiable case without seeing the, the, the deepest sense of irony in what they are arguing for, given the profile and the position of the Conservative government. Of course, I'll give way to Mr. Oliver Mundell. I, I know that, President Officer, this is a member's debate, but the Cabinet Secretary can, on the one hand, make the argument uh, to Labour members that it's not about resources, then uh, point the finger at the Conservative Party uh, for, for not helping his government provide those resources. There clearly is a problem here, and it's above party politics. Education is so important. Does the Cabinet Secretary not recognise that? Cabinet I, I, Secretary. I've, I've been, I've been uh, at pains tonight to suggest that this is not just about attitude and ethos, and it's not just about resources. It is about the combination of these factors, which is why I make my point to the Conservatives that if they are interested in truly investing in public services, and in improving the outcomes for young people as a consequence of the resources that we allocate, they must be prepared, they must be, they must, well, it's all very well for the Conservatives to shout things at me when I'm making the pretty simple point that if they want to be, if they want to be part of the solution of increasing the resources that are available for additional support for learning, they have to be prepared to support budgets that will enable that to be the case. But there are other spokespeople. There are other spokespeople come to Parliament and argue for reductions in public expenditure, and argue against some of the tax measures that the government has brought forward to boost public expenditure. And those are the hard arithmetic arguments the Conservatives cannot avoid. And I'll give Joanne Lamont. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would agree with Chris Cunningham, who's the education spokesperson for the SNP in Glasgow City Council, who said one of the problems in education was that local government had disproportionately been cut, choices made by this government. And my contention that as a consequence, disproportionately young people with additional support needs are being disadvantaged in their education system. And if you agree with me on that, I'm sure that we could get some agreement, not in a false argument about resources, but recognising there are choices your government has made that's had consequences in our local communities. Now, that, Cabinet Secretary, just, just before, before you answer that, and I think we're all obliged to you for taking so many interventions in this very important debate, but I do want to bring matters to conclusion, so if you could respond to that and then bring your remarks to conclusion. Inclusion. Thank you. Um, the, but I, I come back to the points on resources that I've made to John Lamott. The, the, the most recent data that I have available is that local government spent 4.5% uh, in cash terms more on additional support for learning in two th Well, I, I think the I'm in danger of overstaying my welcome at the, at the, at the, at the government uh, dispatch box. Uh, has seen a, a cash terms increase of 4.5% and education spending has increased by 2.5% in cash terms in the most recent figures that are available. So um, it, there is a combination of issues here that have to be wrestled with, which are about attitudes and ethos, which is about whether or not the good guidance that is available from Parliament, supported by the, the uh, parliamentary uh, discussions, which creates the climate to support young people in fulfilling their potential, 
and the question of resources, where I would contend we have a rising uh, resources being uh, applied on education and a rising number of teachers that um, are being recruited into the system. Can I finally close on um, the point raised essentially by my colleague Angela Constance, which um, uh, were two last points to close. The point raised by my colleague Angela Constance, where um, she made the point that uh, there are uh, examples within, of great success in mainstream education in supporting the needs of young people and ensuring that with the right approach that is taken in individual schools, good outcomes can be achieved for individuals with, for young people with additional needs. But crucially, uh, we must ensure that we have in place uh, the approaches that support and train uh, uh, our teachers and our professional staff to support those young people. And lastly, President Officer, can I say that uh, this report is a report which has given me uh, pause for thought uh, it has resulted in me um, holding back the publication of the updated mainstreaming guidance to make sure that we properly address the issues that are raised in this report and that we can do everything within our power to address the issues that affect the life chances of some of the most precious young people in our society. And it's our obligation to make sure we get it right for every one of those children. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.